नमस्कार स्टूडेंट्स होप यू आर हेल एंड हार्टी टेकिंग केयर ऑफ योर हेल्थ एंड योर स्टडीज माय नेम इज ज्योत्सना एंड आई एम फ्रॉम एजुकेशन डिपार्टमेंट चंडीगढ़ हैव यू एवर थॉट व्हाट वाज दैट थिंग व्हिच अट्रैक्टेड ब्रिटिश ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी एंड अलोंग विद दैट द डच और द पोर्चुगीज टू इंडिया व्हाट वर द रिसोर्सेज विच मेड इंडिया अ गोल्डन स्पैरो व्हाट वर द रीजन्स दैट Britishers or Portuguese or Dutch wanted to establish their empire their business empire in India Today's session will focus on all these questions when we take up chapter number 6 from grade 8 book our past part 3 and the name of the chapter is weavers iron smelters and factory owners so without wasting any time let's begin today's session The chapter tells the story of the crafts and industries of India during British rule by focusing on two industries namely textiles and iron and steel. Both these industries were crucial for the industrial revolution in the modern world. Merchandised production of cotton textile made Britain the foremost industrial nation in the 19th century. And when its iron and steel industry started growing from 1850s Britain came to be known as the workshop of the world the industrialization of Britain had a close connection with the conquest and colonization of India before moving ahead let's take glimpses of industry in India farmers in the indus valley were the first to spin and weave cotton In 1929 archaeologists recovered fragments of cotton textiles at Mohenjo-daro which is now in Pakistan dating to between 3250 and 2750 BC tracing the history of weavers in India literary references further point to the ancient nature of the subcontinent's cotton industry empire of cotton goes on to show how the cotton industry which india dominated in early 18th century was taken over by the british how it spurred the slave trade with the americans and industrial revolution its role a century in the independence movement and gandhi's spinning wheel and how it once again returned to asia in a big way at the end of 20th century It is highly likely that the development of textile craft were a key component of the Indus civilization's rise as well. Moving on as regards the metallurgy of metal wrought iron was produced as in all countries in early times by the direct process from ores by smelting them in small blast furnaces without the intermediate production of cast iron. The well-known iron pillar near the Qutub Minar, Delhi and the rectangular iron beams of the temple at puri to which the date 640 ad 1174 ad have been ascribed are cited as examples of the scale on which iron forgings were made and of remarkable skill attained by the workers in the metal these gigantic forgings were constructed by welding together small blooms of iron a method which continued to be practiced in china and japan until the middle of last century the delhi pillar has not rusted to a marked degree and this resistance to corrosion owes to the composition of the iron which is free from manganese and sulfur and contains a tolerably high percentage of phosphorus the method of making woods or indian steel as practiced in india long prior to the manufacture of crucible steel in europe now let's talk about indian textiles and world market around 1750 prior to the british conquest over bengal india was the largest producer of textile in the world from the 16th century european companies started purchasing indian textiles for selling them in europe these exquisitely crafted fabrics had been imported from india in 18th century from the 1680s indian textiles were a craze in england and europe due to its exquisite designs 
superior textures and relative cheapness. Muslin, chintz, bandana were exported in bulk to Europe. There were many other clothes that were known by the place of their origin like clothes from Patna, Orissa, Qasim Bazar and Calcutta. Handloom weaving and related occupations became a source of livelihood for millions of Indians. During the 18th century, the textile industry in England was beginning to grow but faced competition from Indian textiles. Inspired England started setting up its own textile industries in 18th century. However, the popularity of Indian textiles worried English producers and they protested against the import of cotton textile from India. In 1720, a law known as Calico Act was passed to ban the use of chintz in England. Indian designs were copied and printed within England on plain Indian clothes. The competition with the relatively inexpensive Indian textile market also led to technological innovations in English textile industry. The invention of spinning jenny and the steam engine helped to weave very large quantities of clothes at significantly cheaper prices. The Indian textile industry ruled the world market till the end of 18th century, earning huge profits for European companies including the French, English and Dutch. Around 1750, India was the world's largest producer of cotton textiles, renowned both for their fine quality and exquisite craftsmanship. They were traded in Southeast Asia, Java, Sumatra and Penang and West and Central Asia. European trading companies bought Indian textiles and sold them in Europe. World tells us histories. European traders first encountered fine cotton clothes from India carried by Arab merchants in Mosul, present-day Iraq. The Portuguese came to India in search of spices and the cotton textiles they took back to Europe, called calico, derived from calicut. There were many other words which pointed the popularity of Indian textiles in Western markets. Different varieties of clothes were named differently, such as printed cotton clothes were called chintz, corsets or khasa, and bandana. Chintz is derived from the Hindi word chint, a cloth with small and colorful flowery designs. A craze started for Indian cotton textiles in England and Europe, mainly for their exquisite floral designs, fine texture and relative cheapness. Bandana, derived from the word bandhana, refers to any brightly colored and printed scarf for the neck or head produced through a method of tying and dyeing. They began protesting against the import of Indian cotton textiles. In 1720, the British government enacted legislation banning the use of printed cotton textile chintz in England called the Calico Act. In England, textile industries had just begun to develop and they wanted a secure market within the country by preventing the entry of Indian textiles. The calico printing industry was set up under government protection. Indian designs were imitated and printed in England on white muslin or plain unbleachable Indian cloth. In 1764, the spinning jenny was invented by John Kay. Richard Arkwright in 1786 invented the steam engine which revolutionized cotton textile weaving. Indian textiles dominated world trade till the end of 18th century. European trading companies purchased cotton and silk textiles in India by importing silver. Who were the weavers? Weavers belonged to communities that specialized in weaving and skills were passed on from one generation to next. Some of the communities famous for weaving were the Tanti weavers of Bengal, Julahas or Momin weavers of North India, Sail and Kaikola and Devangs of South India. Spinning is the first stage of production where Charkha and the Takli were used. The thread was spun on the Charkha and rolled on Takli. 
after spinning the thread was woven into cloth by weaver for colored textile the thread was dyed by the dyer known as rangres for printed cloth the weavers needed the help of specialist block printers known as chipigars the decline of indian textile in britain cotton industries were developed which affected textile producers in india indian textiles had to compete with british textile in european and american markets exporting textiles to england also became increasingly difficult since very high duties were imposed on indian textiles imported into britain in africa america and europe indian goods traditional market was ousted by english made cotton textiles english and european companies stopped buying indian goods and distressed weavers wrote petitions to the government to help them by the 1830s british cotton cloth flooded indian markets which affected specialist weavers and spinners in india handloom weaving continued as some type of clothes which could not be supplied by machines sholapur in western india and madura in south india emerged as important new centers of weaving in the late 19th century mahatma gandhi during the national movement urged people to boycott imported textiles and use hand spun and hand woven clothes khadi became a symbol of nationalism and the charkha represented india the charkha was put at the center of the tricolor of the indian national congress adopted in 1931 now let's talk about cotton mills in 1854 the first cotton mill was set up in bombay and it had grown as an important port for the export of raw cotton from india to england and china in bombay over 84 mills were established by parsi and gujarati businessmen by 1900 Mills started developing in cities and first mill in Ahmedabad was started in 1861. Growth of cotton mills demanded labor. Poor peasants, artisans and agricultural laborers worked in the mills. Textile factory industry in India faced problems such as difficulty competing with the cheap textiles imported from Britain in most countries. the government supported industrialization by imposing heavy duties on imports which eliminated competition and protected infant industries the first major spurt in the development of cotton factory production in india therefore was during the first world war when textile imports from britain declined and indian factories were called upon to produce cloth for military supplies Let's talk about the sword of Tipu Sultan and Woods steel. The sword of Tipu Sultan was special because it had an incredibly hard and sharp edge that could easily rip through the opponent's armor. This quality of sword came from a special type of high carbon steel called woods which was produced all over South India. Woods steel when made into swords produce a very sharp edge with a flowing water pattern which came from very small carbon crystals embedded in the iron woods steel was produced in many hundreds of smelting furnaces in mysore in these furnaces iron was mixed with charcoal and put inside small clay pots through an intricate control of temperature the smelters produced steel in gods used for sword making woods is an anglicized version of kannada word ukku telugu hukku and tamil and malayalam urukku meaning steel woods steel making process was widely known in south india which completely lost its existence by mid 19th century the swords and armors making industry died with the conquest of india by british and imports of iron and steel from england displaced the iron and steel produced by crafts people in india so what happened to the abandoned furnaces in villages 
Wood's steel production required a highly specialized technique of refining iron. In India, iron smelting was common till the end of 19th century. In Bihar and central India, every district had smelter. The furnaces were built of clay and sun-dried bricks. By the late 19th century, the craft of iron smelting declined. The reason was the government prevented people from entering the reserved forests. The government granted access to the forest in some areas, but the iron smelters had to pay a very high tax to the foreign department for every furnace they used. By the late 19th century, iron and steel were imported from Britain. By the early 20th century, the artisans producing iron and steel faced new competition. Iron and steel factories came up in India. In 1904, Charles Weld, an American geologist, and Durabji Tata, the eldest son of Jamshedji Tata, traveled to Chhattisgarh in search of iron ore deposits. They wanted to set up a modern iron and steel plant in India. After traveling for months, Weld and Durabji found Rajahara Hills, which had one of the finest ores in the world. But the region was dry and water was not to be found nearby. So the search continued and the Agarias helped in discovery of a source of iron ore. A large area of forest was cleared on the banks of river Subarnarekha to set up the factory and an industrial township, Jamshedpur. The Tata Iron and Steel Company, Tisco, began producing steel in 1912. Before Tisco, India was importing steel that was manufactured in Britain. The situation was changed by the time Tisco set up. In 1914, the First World War broke out. The steel production in Britain had to meet the demands of war in Europe. The war continued for several years, so Tisco had to produce shells and carriage wheels for the war. Tisco became the biggest steel industry within the British Empire. In the case of iron and steel, industrial expansion occurred when British imports into India declined and the market for Indian industrial goods increased. The development of the nationalist movement and the industrial class emerged stronger. The demand for government protection became louder. So let's quickly go through the focal points of today's chapter. First and foremost, we talked about the history related with different kind of industries in India. Starting from Mohan Jadaro, how cotton and cotton weavers can be traced long back in the Indus Valley civilization. Moving on, the Indian textile and the world market, wherein we discuss the muslin, chintz, bandana types of cloth produced by India, which were very famous in Europe, and how Calico Act came into being in England. Moving on, we did the decline of Indian textile. How, with the arrival of 20th century, the Indian textile faced a major setbacks. Among the cotton mills, we learned how the first cotton mill was established in Bombay in 1854. Then we talked about wood steel. We talked about Tipu Sultan and his famous sword. How the sword and armor making industry died with the conquest of India by British and imports of iron and steel from England. What happened to the abandoned furnaces in the villages? How iron and steel factories came up in India? And finally, how Tata Iron and Steel Company, famously known as Tisco, came into being in 1912. Today's session was an enriching experience, I know that. So let's try to analyze what exactly have we extracted out of it. On your screens, you can see a statement and along with that, there are four options to it. You have to pick the correct option. So let's get going. Dash on the West Coast was one of the important sources of trade from Indian Ocean in the early 17th century. Bombay, Surat, Kozikod, or Kandala. Yes, it is option B, Surat. Very good. 
dash were mainly using the Surat coast for trade until late 18th century. French, Chinese, Dutch or Portuguese. Dutch were mainly using the Surat coast for trade until late 18th century. As its industry grew in 18th century, Dash came to be known as workshop of the world. France, Britain, Portugal or Holland. Yes, it was Britain indeed. Before 1750, Dash was the largest producer of cotton textiles in the world. India, Britain, Burma or China. Yes, it was India indeed, which was the largest producer of cotton textile in the world before 1750. Dash were woven in Surat and Ahmedabad and was highly valued in Indonesia. Patola, Muslin, Bombay dyeing or Paithani. It is Patola. British named Dash as Muslin since they came across it for the first time in Mosul, Iraq. Pepper, cardamom, cotton or silk. Yes, Muslin was the famous cotton from India. So, it is option C, cotton. In 1854, where did cotton mill came up? Was it in Surat, Kanpur, Bombay or Madras? In 1854, the mill came up in Bombay. Tisco came up in the city of Bilai, Jamshedpur, Surat or Mumbai. Yes, it is Jamshedpur, option B. Indian economy has had a journey of its own. It's been a roller coaster ride. Many intruders came, exploited its resources, and went away. But we managed to get back on our feet every time. That is the beauty of our country. We'll be back with many more videos. Till then, stay safe, stay healthy, and keep studying. Namaskar.